When Spider-Man 2 came out in 2004, it raised the bar for what a superhero film could be. Not only did it feature bigger and more thrilling action sequences, but it also explored the burden of being a superhero and the personal cost of balancing a double life. So naturally, following its critical and commercial success, expectations were insanely high for the third entry of the trilogy. They love me. But unfortunately for fans, the film was unable to stick the landing. Director Sam Raimi himself has since voiced disappointment with the end result and jokingly called the film awful. But when he and his brother Ivan first sat down to outline what would become Spider-Man 3, they envisioned a very different film than what we got. So let's take a look back at what could have been Spider-Man 3. Unfortunately, even at the start of development, Raimi wanted to retcon Uncle Ben's death to make Sandman his killer. Not only did he want Peter to grapple with seeking vengeance, but he wanted to make him feel that he had much more in common with the villains he faced. And while I certainly appreciate the journey of vengeance and ultimately forgiveness that Raimi wanted Peter to go on, I feel Uncle Ben's death already served as Peter's catalyst for becoming Spider-Man and bringing it back into the narrative felt kind of unnecessary. Not only that, but it also recontextualizes Peter letting this guy fall to his death. Having said that, in this version of the film, Sandman would have teamed up with Vulture. After being defeated and then apprehended by Spidey in the film's opening during a robbery, Vulture would have been thrown in jail, leaving him to develop an intense hatred of Spider-Man, similar to Peter's lust for revenge against Sandman. Speaking of Sandman, he and Vulture would find themselves sharing a cell, where Vulture would talk him into joining his quest for vengeance against Spider-Man. The two would then devise a prison break and corral other escapees into wreaking havoc on the city in order to draw out Spidey and wear him down with the goal of finally pouncing on him at his weakest moment. Now since this went through several revisions, there are two different versions of this ending with Vulture. The first has Vulture escaping to set him up as the main antagonist in the fourth film, while the other ending has Peter offering Vulture a truce, which he would refuse and then die during their big fight, thus illustrating to Peter the ramifications of an inability to forgive. Ben Kingsley was in negotiations to play the role before producer Avi Arad stepped in and argued that Vulture didn't make for a compelling villain, given as he had no personal ties to Spider-Man beyond petty vengeance. In addition to this, Arad reportedly told Raimi that he felt the series had featured too much of Raimi's personal favorite Spider-Man villains instead of characters modern fans were actually interested in, namely Venom. After dragging his feet, Raimi reluctantly agreed and nixed Vulture and replaced him with fan favorite Venom. Unfortunately, what we got wasn't the Venom we had all come to know and love. Instead, Raimi made Eddie Brock more of a mirror image universe version of Peter, removing the anti-hero side of him and making him a full-on unlikable villain. Oh, you're being filmed. That's why you're so charming. That's not, oh please, I'm a very no. I'm joking. And not only did Raimi make Eddie Brock smaller in stature too, but he did the same to Venom, making him sound more like a baby velociraptor <laughs> versus the terrifying and intimidating symbiote we're all familiar with. Eyes, lungs, pancreas, so many snacks, so little time. And if you thought the studio and producers were done meddling, I've got some bad news for you, as they only requested more additions. At their insistence, Raimi was forced to shoehorn Gwen Stacy into the mix too. Raimi's original goal was to just stick with our core characters and progress their relationships to the next logical step. But the studio only wanted more! Raimi now had to balance Peter's main journey of revenge and forgiveness, establish Sandman and his backstory, introduce the symbiote and Eddie Brock and Black suit Spider-Man, conclude Harry's arc, explore Peter's ongoing relationship with Mary Jane, and introduce newcomer Gwen Stacy. That's a lot to juggle in one two-hour film, and with so many plot strands, Raimi began to explore splitting the film into two parts. The only reason he abandoned the strategy was he and his team couldn't come up with a satisfying
satisfying cliffhanger to close out part one, and thus settled for making one overstuffed movie. Also, it's worth noting that up until late in production, the film had a very different climax. Earlier in the film, while Peter is still possessed by the symbiote, he all but destroys his romantic relationship with Mary Jane, and begins dating Gwen Stacy instead. Then during the climax of the film, instead of kidnapping Mary Jane, Venom would have kidnapped Peter's current girlfriend, Gwen Stacy. One of the reasons Raimi initially wanted to do this was because he didn't want yet another climax that featured Mary Jane as the damsel in distress. Not only that, but by adding Gwen to the climax, it would have increased the tension and the stakes, as every comic book fan knows that Gwen eventually dies by falling to her death. However, I imagine Raimi changed this to Mary Jane to add more motivation for Harry wanting to team up with Spider-Man, as he's not only coming back to help his friend, but to save the woman they both love too. This is why Gwen basically disappears from the rest of the film after the infamous jazz club scene. One of Raimi's key collaborators that was noticeably absent from Spider-Man 3 was composer Danny Elfman, responsible for creating Spider-Man's iconic theme and score. Now, before I explain why they had their falling out, I need to give a little bit of context as to the post-production process first. For those unaware, the musical score is recorded after the edit is locked and is one of the last things that's added to the film. While the film is being edited, however, what will often happen is temp music will be laid down in its place, later to be replaced by the finished score. One of the things that caused the rift between Elfman and Raimi on Spider-Man 2 was that Raimi stubbornly grew attached to the temp score used in the rough edit of the film, which hindered Elfman's creativity when it came time to compose new music for the film, as Raimi basically forced him to copy the temp music. And I imagine the temp music was just reused cues from the first film. While Elfman called working on Spider-Man 2 a miserable experience, he more famously said of his relationship with Raimi that one day it was like Raimi went to sleep, somebody put a pod next to him, and when he awoke, he wasn't the same person Elfman had known for the last decade. Fortunately, both men eventually were able to reconcile and have since worked together again. However, Elfman's absence did give us this iconic musical motif, which I'll have to sing for copyright reasons. Ba -bum -ba 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 -da 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 -da. Still, as an Elfman fan, I can't help but wonder what he would have done musically with Black Suit Spider-Man. Speaking of Black Suit Spider-Man, it's also worth noting that had we got the original version of this film, we wouldn't have gotten Emo Peter and this moment, which, depending on who you ask, is either terrible or a cinematic masterpiece. Personally, I always thought this was a riot and a callback to the raindrops keep falling on my head sequence from Spider-Man 2. But I know there's plenty out there who hate it. I do think, however, a lot of people miss the point of this sequence. Not only does the symbiote remove your inhibitions, but keep in mind Peter's an awkward dork. And this is what his idea of cool, cocky, and arrogant looks like. Even if to us, he just looks ridiculous and cringeworthy. Anyway, that's just my two cents. While Raimi did his best to make this all work, ultimately this film collapsed under its own weight. Raimi has since come out and said that he didn't believe in all of the characters, and I imagine he's mostly referring to Venom and Gwen Stacy. And if the director's heart isn't in it, chances are that's going to be telegraphed on the screen too. To his credit, producer Avi Arad has since revealed that he regretted forcing Venom on Raimi, and that it was unwise to force a filmmaker to work with characters they just aren't passionate about. After feeling like he let the franchise's fans down after Spider-Man 3, Raimi wanted to make it up to them with Spider-Man 4, and looked to feature Vulture as the film's primary villain, as well as Felicia Hardy, aka Black Cat. Unfortunately, Sony had other plans and wanted Raimi to also include the Lizard 2. This time, however, Raimi dug in his heels and, not wanting to overload the film with too many characters and storylines like the last one, refused to back down. Reaching an impasse, both he and the studio ultimately agreed to part ways. It should be noted, however, that Raimi was also unsatisfied with the Spider-Man 4 script, even after going through numerous revisions, and his inability to get it to a place he liked in order to begin shooting and meet the summer release date may have also played a factor in his departure. Never say never, however, as Toby's introduction into the multiverse may have opened a door, or a portal, for the possibility of a fourth Raimi film. Let me know in the comments below if that's something you'd like to see, and if you haven't already, don't forget to please hit that subscribe button so you can be first in line to see what I got coming at you next. Thanks for watching, everybody.